Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much uh, for your applause. Thanks so much for having me here. Uh, thanks so much to the guy who loaned me a pen uh, during the break so I could write this talk. Uh, you might think that's a lie. Uh, it isn't. I, uh, I composed um, what I believe the body of this talk will be during the break, and actually the last 10 minutes of it. Um, I had some ideas, and I had shared some of those ideas, but the whole of it came to form in my brain in about the last 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, and that's the way that I work. That is the truth of it. Um, I am an improviser. And uh, how many, just before I even move on, uh, how many of you here uh, have seen uh, improvisation before? A few, hands up. Did you, where did you see it? Was it at like a bad corporate event and there was like a luncheon? <laughs> a lot of that, was I doing it? <laughs> I feel bad, sorry. I don't feel bad, I probably got paid for it. Okay, now here, uh, that concept of improvising in front of people and, and doing scene work and playing characters, that is performative improvisation. Um, but for me, and, and for a lot of people that work in that field, it actually becomes a way of life. Uh, and that's what I believe that I do. I improvise. Um, it's not a job, per se. Uh, I mean, it's kind of a job. It's not one your parents are proud of. Certainly not mine. Uh, no, they're lovely people. I mean, they're attractive people. They're not, <laughs> they don't love my job. Um, but, um, but it has become the way that I understand the world around me. Uh, and so when it came time to prepare this talk, or when it comes time to, uh, to uh, prepare a show, produce a show, when it comes time to organize a festival, whatever it is. The bulk of the work for me is done towards the end because the way that I understand reality and my capacity as an individual is in the moment. That's how I know what will happen. I have to have it happening. Um, so that's what improvisation is to me. Um, and for those of you that have seen it before, maybe you have a bit of a reference. Let me, uh, let me backtrack. When I was 14 years old, I tried it for my high school improv team, which many of you may be aware of, um, here in the city. And uh, when, I, uh, when I went into the audition, I had never been, uh, I'd never improvised before, or not in a formatted sense, and so I didn't really know what was going to happen. And they said, we want you to act like a gold prospector, but we want you to try and tell the story of Little Red Riding Hood while you're doing it. That was my audition piece. Um, and I didn't know anything about gold prospectors. I didn't even know what that was. Uh, but I just thought of what it looked like in my head, and it was an old man with missing teeth and an old hat over it and a big beard, and I thought, he might use the word thicket, because I had a Br'er Rabbit book when I was a kid, and I, somehow there was a connection to be made there for me, so I went in and played an old man, and I kept just using the word thicket, and everybody was laughing, and so what, was, what I learned in that moment was, uh, in the moment, if I employ the things I know, I will succeed, and that has formed the way I have become as a human being. So let me, uh, let me explain a little bit about what's happening in improvisation, for those of you that have seen it live, or have seen improvised jazz music, uh, or, or anything like that. Uh, what's happening in the moment is that uh, the band or the live improv performers are making offers to each other. They're not saying things, you know, a character doesn't come on stage and say something, a musician doesn't play something, they make offers to each other. They are offering things up to be taken, changed, and inspired from, and given back, and offered back. That's what improvisers are doing. It's like, you know, the dumbest, most horrible improv show you've ever seen, where they're wearing Viking hats and making toilet jokes, is a delicate dance underneath. <laughs> it's really quite beautiful. Uh, it's horrible to watch, but it's beautiful. Inside, the conversation happening inside is really something to behold. And, uh, and I love it. I love to watch human beings communicate on that level, and I love to do it myself. Um, what they're doing is they are giving offers and they're listening to each other. When we say, we say in improvisation, listen to each other. When I teach improvisation, you'll often see young improvisers, especially, or, or, or ones who are a little bit nervous, uh, yelling over top of each other. One person's yelling something, another person's yelling something back. They're not paying attention. So I will stop the scene and I will say, listen to your partner. They're trying to tell you something. So they will stop, take in what they're being told, digest it, and react. That's how you learn that process, that dialogue. That's what improvisation is at its core. You are giving, listening, and giving and uh, receiving back from your, uh, from your fellow performers. And that metaphor, I think, extends to human beings as well, very much so. So let me tell you about something that happened to me a couple years ago. Um, 
A couple years ago, I quit uh, a full-time job that I had, which was providing me with a lot of security. I was still performing and, and creating um, uh, improvisation or theater or comedy or whatever it was. Uh, but I was working a full-time job, which was providing me a lot of security, which I loved. Um, but, I, uh, but I quit it, and I went back to being a self-employed artist, like I was right out of university. And I had a lot of fear, because it seemed to me, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this, that a lot of questions, rightly so, were being asked in this community, in, uh, in my community anyway, Saskatchewan, Canada, um, about what the investment truly is, socially, culturally, politically. Uh, for people who want to live and function as artists, whether they are musicians, actors, dancers, writers, whatever it is. Um, I wasn't sure that this was a place I could be a creator and, and, um, and have the life that I wanted to lead because it was the thing I wanted to do. It is the way I want to live my life and I don't want to have to um, give that up. Uh, but I wasn't sure that this was the place and certainly we've all heard uh, the phrase brain drain get used a hundred times, whether it's for people who work in the technology field or, or people who are artists um, or academics who are trained here or born here and leave for greener pastures. And certainly I have seen that happen across the board with most of the artists I grew up with or were trained with or were in my community. I see them leave because they see the vibrant culture that's happening in other places and they want to be a part of it. And I, I, I don't begrudge them that. Um, and I, I, started, I started questioning whether that was the best avenue for me as well, whether, uh, whether I could find the things I wanted somewhere else. Um, but I started thinking about that idea of leaving for something better. And I realized, you know what, that happens in improvisation too. I see that all the time. When people are performing in a scene that's going poorly, it's just tanking, you've probably seen it, it's just death. And you feel so <laughs> sorry for them and they don't want to be in it anymore, they will quit. And they'll say, give us another suggestion. Give us another, something to be inspired by. I want to try a different thing. Or what happens more often is they're sitting on the side watching other improvisers performing. And when something's going great, when, when those people are really hitting a moment of inspiration and passion and it's funny and it's touching and it's inspiring, they tag in. These improvisers over here, they tag in because they're hoping that that joy is going to rub off on them. Like, I'm going to involve myself, and somehow I'll feel the same way, and I'll be a part of the success that's happening here, right? And when I see that, when I'm teaching, or when I'm watching a show and I see that, I hate it. When I'm teaching, I will stop the scene and say, don't tag into someone else's scene and, make it, and try to make it yours. Just make your scene better. Or if they stop their scene and say, give us another suggestion, I said, no, go back and use your suggestion. Make it better. And... I'm sure you can see the metaphor I'm driving at. There is a thing that happens where we feel like maybe we don't belong, or things are going to be difficult, or that we're not capable uh, of improving our lot, and so we jump ship, as opposed to making our own scene better and finding a way to improve it. And I realized that a couple of years ago, that the thing that I was considering doing, leaving and finding greener pastures, is the thing I hate the most about the art form I love the most. And I thought, maybe, uh, maybe the way that I work should be more related to the work that I do, and that I should involve those skills, because they're very applicable. That concept of living in a place that doesn't support you is terrifying. But you know what else is terrifying? Improvisation and making things up on the spot, and not knowing where you're going to go next, like I'm doing right now. <laughs> I didn't write any of this down. I don't, I'm not even following the script I wrote before the show. <laughs> because I don't know, uh, because that's how I have to function in this moment. And I'm using those same skills, which I think are applicable, not just for performers or artists, but for anyone going through the same, uh, the same dilemma. So I'm going to share some of those with you. I think I'm going to share four skills with you, improv skills, that I think are applicable for all people. So the first one is acceptance. In improvisation, we, like I say, we make offers to each other, and the thing that we require of our partners is that they accept them. That they, as we say, say yes to them. Uh, anyone who's taken an improv class or, or a motivational speaking thing at your work, I'm sure that they have said this to you before. But it's true. as, as um, as new agey and hug everybody as it feels, say yes to everything. 
It's true. I'm a huge skeptic, and I know it's true. Um, we, we, we insist in improvisation that you take the things you are given and you accept them. You say yes to them, even the offers that are poor or negative. If somebody gives you a bad offer or one that is weak or one that's not really helping, you don't have the option of saying no to it. You must say yes to it. And in fact, we ask that you say yes to it and give back more than you got. So you take a thing that seems like an obstacle and you treat it like a gift. When I teach improvisation, I teach a really fun game uh, called Monkey Wrench. And the way that it works is you have two people and they're doing a scene and it's a really mundane scene. The scene doesn't need to be special. So it's two people, uh, they're having a cup of tea. They're having a picnic, lovely couple having a cup of tea. Oh, isn't this tea delicious? Oh, it's the exact right temperature. I'm so glad we came to sit on this hill. That's it, they're just having a conversation. And it's a third person's job to come in from the back or the side and try to absolutely destroy the reality of the scene. So they come in as like a giant apocalyptic robot and <laughs> shooting laser beams and just destroying the reality of the scene. O ostensibly ruining it, blocking the offers that are being made, not listening, destroying the reality. And it's up to the two people that are there to not only accept that offer, but treat it like it's the one they always wanted. You were praying that the giant death robot would come and finally someone did it. Drinking the tea robot, death, 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 world is ending. And the tea, the tea couple goes, oh, the apocalypse is here. It's a good thing we got this picnic in before we all died. Cheers, clink. I just made that stupid example up. Um, but it illustrates the point that um, you can treat things that you're not expecting as obstacles or you can treat them as opportunities uh, for yourself. That's the idea of acceptance. I, I was just recently thinking uh, a metaphor that I had never thought of, I just thought of it the other day, is that uh, the seven steps of grieving, denial, betrayal, or whatever it is, anger, bargaining, we just skip all of those and just go to the good stuff, the acceptance at the end. Just get over all your garbage and go to the happy part where you accept it. That's where improv starts. The other improv skill that I think is really applicable in this scenario um, is this idea of accepting your environment. And I think that's the most applicable thing for me, uh, especially in this community that I live in. Um, the couple having a, a cup of tea, a thing that we will sometimes do in improv is include your environment, include your world. Accept the offers that are being given by your environment. So they're sipping a cup of tea, oh my, it's raining. And then for the rest of the scene, they're wiping their face or they're pulling a coat over their head or they leave the picnic and go somewhere else because their environment has given them an offer. Why am I still holding the teacup? Um, and so, uh, what is this environment that we live in? Let's extend the metaphor uh, to the place where I live. Uh, I live in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. I was born and raised here. It is resource-based. As a city, it is very lateral, difficult to walk, which means there are not concentrated artistic communities, which makes it difficult to grow a scene. It's difficult to market in, not just because it's lateral, so posters, handbills, that kind of thing doesn't really work, it's difficult to market in this space because we are young and relatively inexperienced culturally as a city. When you look at larger centers, even in Canada, there is a longer history and a longer tradition of not only concentrated people, but of arts and culture being ingrained in the community. And we don't have that yet. So it's difficult to market to people, not just because you have to tell them you have a show, but because you have to tell them that shows even happen here. There are shows that happen. <laughs> what kind of show is it? A, a theater show. Well, I don't like those. Okay, well, you have, there's so many extra steps. In any other city, if you go there, you can pick up a listing and go, well, I know that there are shows happening, obviously, probably dozens of them. It's just on me to find them. And here that is not the case. That makes it difficult. One thing that, especially for arts and culture events, is, uh, is seemingly competition is that we are a very sports-centric uh, culture as well. And I hear a lot of artists that I am friends with complain about that, especially during football season. They're like, oh, well, the only thing people care about is football. And my response is, then don't book a show on game day. That's not an obstacle, that's an offer your environment is making you. It is telling you this is where you live. And we don't, unfortunately, have the luxury of a big enough arts community that we can only market to them. Our population just won't support it. So if I want to succeed as an artist, 
uh, I need to make myself relevant to everybody. I don't get to have a house full of artists. I need everybody there. And my everybody is telling me uh, that they want to go to a sports event on Saturday. So don't book a show. In improvisation, we talk about this idea of endowment. That is making an offer to somebody. You endow something on them. But what you also do is you tell them something about themselves. So if I make you an offer with a cup of tea, oh, here's a cup of tea. I know it's your favorite. I'm telling you something. I'm endowing that into you. This is your favorite. This is something I think we need more of in our community and that I am really trying to do, which is I'm trying to tell people things about themselves that I think will help. When I meet a young performer especially, or I'm teaching a class, I want to tell them something I don't think someone else has pointed out. After a class or after a show, walking up to them and saying, hey, I noticed you're really good at this. I just want to say, it, it doesn't go unnoticed. You're talented in that way. Because ideally, I have endowed them with this gift, this concept, this thing that they can internalize now, and they will return it to people. They'll learn to endow back and grow the community that way. And the last thing is, I believe in the idea of relationships to grow an artistic community. In improvisation, we relate to one another on stage. That's the way a scene grows. The way we do that is instead of talking, we reveal things about ourselves. We go up to other characters on stage and we tell them things about ourselves, personal things, things that are honest and from the heart, and we offer that so that they can relate to us. If I say, I'm scared of heights, anyone in here will think, I'm scared of heights too, or I'm not scared of heights, what's that, guy? What's that guy's problem? But now we're relating to each other. And I feel the biggest gift that you can give to someone in an artistic community or in a community in general to help grow it from the inside is to be honest about who you are and the work that you're doing in hopes that they will then relate to you and want to give back, relate ideas back to you about themselves. Because then you're conversing and then you're relevant. And when you're relevant to each other, you're a community. You're making your scene better by employing those skills. I have made my decision to stay here. I made it about a year ago, where I'm not leaving. I'm going to stay and accept the offers I'm being given. And ideally, when my scene is better, I won't ever have to look for a different one, because it will have already been grown. Thank you very much.